Yep, we're going to do a game by game, Taylor. I'm ready to save that question for right when we go. Yeah, we are back for the MLB DFS breakdown, the build. Uh, we've been gone for the past two weeks or so, but uh, we're ready to break down a nice big main slate over at DraftKings. Lots to go over. Um, we're going to start with the Mets and the Twins. Uh, first, before we do get started, if this video helps you out in any way, please give this video a like and also consider su subscribing to the DFS build. Helps us know that we're doing something right and also alerts you for future videos just like this. NFL season's almost here. Where we're going to try to do stuff for preseason, uh, maybe even some more season-long content before the season uh, rolls around, and of course, uh, DFS too. So let's dive into it. The Mets have uh, our Mets are facing David Festa. On the other side, the Twins are facing Sean Manaya. I don't love anything here in this game, really. I guess if I did target anything, I'd go Mets against the unproven Festa. Uh, his numbers so far, small sample size for sure, but the numbers are not great. Um, so, yeah, I'd probably go Mets here, if anything. Otherwise, I'm kind of not going after this game. How about you? I think the only thing I'm getting to is Manaya a little bit because he's 7'9", and he's an okay enough pitcher. And it's kind of a shaky slate once you get past a handful of names i think we're going to see a lot of ownership on hunter brown griffin canning robbie ray um so manaya i expect will be pretty contrarian that's really the only reason to consider him i'm not really on the bats here it's a bad part for bats and festa is not really someone i'm interested in so it's pretty much manaya or nothing for me yeah, Mania coming in at about 12% ownership, so you're spot on about that. And his projection isn't that bad at 15 fantasy points. So kind of like we we're saying, off uh, the air, so to speak. Um, obviously, the Twins have some power, uh, but you know they are not always the most formidable lineup, too. So I'm okay with Mania, uh, but um, probably Mets for this game for me. But really, I'm trying to avoid this game because it's not really standing out for me. All right, Cubs and Reds. I swear every time a great American ballpark game is on the slate, this like these are the chalky offenses. And I guess for good reason, great park for offense. Uh, but we do have a uh, reasonable pitching here with Justin Steele taking on the uh, Reds and well, Nick Martinez, <laughs> not reasonable, uh, but he's taking on the Cubs. So I would imagine one or both of these offenses are going to garner a lot of ownership for good reason. But because of that, I personally will be looking to go elsewhere. Uh, obviously, I'd favor the Cubs. They get a big park upgrade. They're facing Nick Martinez, 176 ISO to lefties this year and 153 last year. So I guess I'd favor the lefties here, but across the board, the Cubs stack looks good. I just to be a little bit hesitant to go uh, heavy on them just because I'm imagining they're going to be owned. Um, on the other side, the Reds are fine. Obviously, a good ballpark, and they can get after lefties, but Justin Steele is not a bad pitcher. So um, I would go Cubs here mostly, and... Uh, but I would not go heavy on it if it's going to be a high-owned spot. Yeah, I'm not on the pitching. I think both offenses are reasonable enough. Um, Martinez being the worst of the two pitchers. So if you want to get to Chicago, I get it. But not a very good offense. I don't know. It's not exciting to me. I think the Reds look a little bit better. Even against a better pitcher, I think the Reds lineup is just more talented. A uh, decent combo of speed and power between guys like De La Cruz and India. If he's still there by the trade deadline and all that. Um, High France is there now, so that's really exciting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's really bats or nothing. I don't, but neither offense is like my highest own stack on the slate. Yeah, before we started the show, I said, oh, I, I bet you the Cubs are going to be high owned. And you said, I hope so, because then you can just get away from them because you're not even that excited about them in the first place. So I am there with you, um, but I don't mind the Cubs. I think if you get to the Cubs, assuming they're not super owned, they're, they're totally fine. All right, we go to the Red Sox and the Mariners at Fenway Park. Obviously not a great spot for pitchers. Uh, Luis Castillo tries to tame the Red Sox, so I'm not super interested in him. The Red Sox have been pretty good lately. Obviously, the, any offense in this park is going to be dangerous. Uh, what's his price tag, actually? Yeah, pretty steep at 9.2K in this spot against this offense, so not really into that. Uh, James Paxton. Uh, well, the Mariners, their strikeout percentage is uh, aided or not aided by Luis Castillo here, so their strikeout numbers do not look as bad as they had been earlier in the year. Um, they made some moves to bring in a couple guys that helped that as well. So, yeah, I mean, the price on Paxton is okay. And the Mariners, you know, the Mariners we knew previously, it would have been a good spot, but I think I'm with you. You said this before we started that Paxton is probably a trap. Um, so I'm really just thinking offenses here. Obviously it's good park winds blowing out 15 miles per hour. Um, and I think I'm leaning Mariners over Red Sox, but 
either are totally fine. I think Paxton is one of the worst pitchers on the slate and one of the worst pitchers in the league. So Seattle's my highest on stack by a pretty decent amount right now. He's a low strikeout guy. His strikeout rate on the season is like 16%. Um, with the Dodgers, now he's in Boston. Negative contact shift going into Fenway. Hitter-friendly weather with wind blowing out and muggy conditions. So Seattle looks good. Rosa Reina is in the lineup now. Uh, Dylan Moore, good numbers against lefties. Mitch Carver as well. Cal Raleigh. Uh, Victor Robles has been good since he arrived for some reason. So decent lineup. Jorge Polanco is still cheap. Uh, numbers aren't good this season from the right side, but uh, I'll take a cheap righty at Fenway against a guy like Paxton anytime. So the Mariners look great. Uh, I think Boston's okay, but Castillo is not generally a guy I want to pick on. Not, also not going to play him at his salary on this slate. So uh, this game, it's the Mariners and then a huge gap to the Red Sox, and I'm not getting to the pitching at all. Um, yeah, I agree with the Castillo take. I think it's not really a hammer the Red Sox necessarily. It's just probably don't play Castillo. Boston is fine, but obviously he is a good pitcher. Um, worth noting, he's not really going to pick up any ownership, 4% owned. So he is good. If, if he can come in here and slice up Boston, that could be a low owned pitcher play to consider, but I'm not going to go there personally. Uh, and I'm with you on the Mariners. Uh, the only problem is they like the Cubs do look like they're going to be pretty owned and for good reason. So I might hesitate to go fully load up the Mariners here just because they're probably going to pull ownership. Uh, Texas gets to face the Cardinals. we got Max Scherzer against St. Louis. I think Scherzer looks totally fine. He had a terrible outing two games ago with negative six fancy points. Bounced back against the White Sox with 31. So will the real Max Scherzer please stand up? Um, Cardinals strike out almost 23% of the time. I think it's a fine matchup. I don't mind him at 8.5K. That's a discounted price for who he can be. Uh, and on the other side, you have Lance Lynn going up against Texas. Obviously, historically struggles against lefties. Um, and they have quite a few to throw at him. So I like Texas here, and I like Max Scherzer here. Yeah, I have no problem getting to Texas. Lance Lynn is not very good anymore. The lineup is okay. It's not as imposing. As, you know, They're not as good as they were last season, though they do have Josh Young, I think, back in the lineup today. So they're at least a little deeper than they have been. Um, ballpark's not great, but I'm okay with Texas. Um, not getting to the Cardinals, not getting to Scherzer at his salary at all, actually. Um, yeah, the Cardinals aren't a great offense to pick on. Scherzer's been kind of up and down. I think his strikeout stuff is declining since he's old. So it's understandable. Um, but this is largely a stay away. I think Texas is an okay kind of secondary stack if you're multi-entering, but, um, not the greatest game overall. I will say that Scherzer is only $300 more than an extremely chalky Robbie Ray. So if you're not on Robbie Ray at 47% ownership and or you want to leverage against him with the athletics or something, pivoting from him to Scherzer, who's coming in at 9% ownership, is a play to consider. Or at least you can kind of, like, even now if you're running a ton of lineups out. All right, Pirates and Astros. You got Bailey Falter taking on Houston. I'm going to definitely side with the Houston side of that. Obviously not a really good park for hitting, but... If I'm going to do anything in this game, it's probably the Astros. And then, of course, Hunter Brown, who gets the Pirates with a 25% collective whiff rate. He's been awesome. Uh, only issue there at all would be his price. But at 9K, I think that's perfectly reasonable for who he's been. I mean, he's been actually like killing it. 18-plus fantasy points in like nine of his last 10 games or something crazy. He's been really, really good. So uh, that is chalk I don't mind eating. And let's see, his ownership's at 31%. You could opt to leverage that with the Pirates or something if you wanted to, but I will not. Yeah, Hunter Brown is my highest owned player on the slate, or highest exposed player, I guess. Uh, good spot. He's good. He's underpriced for who he is. The Pirates are not a very imposing offense, so I like it all the way around. Houston against Balter is decent. Um, kind of an expensive stack. They haven't done that well overall against lefties this season. The best hitter against lefties is... Uh, Jordan Alvarez, even lefty lefty. Otherwise, it's okay. Um, kind of a middle of the road stack for me, but Hunter Brown's easily the most interesting player in the game. 100% agree. All right, the Braves are still in Milwaukee taking on the Brewers. Bryce Elder is always none of the exciting. Uh, the Brewers have been very 
kind of cold lately. They had a bounce back game uh, in their what well, last two games. I think they beat the Mar- they beat the Marlins in the last game of that series. And then did they win the last game against the Braves? Actually, just yesterday. Let me see. No. Yeah, eight to three. So they bounced back a little bit the last two games, but they had been cold. Um, I don't know. I just don't like Elder here. I'm okay with the Brewers in the park, but not really excited about them either. I think you could definitely attack Joe Ross with the Braves if you want to. Not super excited about this game in general. I think if I had to pick one side, it would be the Atlanta Bats. Yeah, I agree. It'd be Atlanta for me. Um, I'm not sure if Jorge Soler is in the player pool, but that's a boost to their lineup if he is, and you can play him. Um, not totally certain about that, but... He is. Okay. Well, if he's in the lineup, then yeah, it looks a little better for them. Good park and all that too, so it's fine. Pitching is a stay away, and the Brewers' bats are not really firmly on my radar either. No, obviously they're down Yelich too, so they're just not at full strength. Uh, and Elder is kind of just the classic decent real life guy who doesn't really give up much of damage, but isn't really a fun fantasy guy. He just like anytime I've ever played him, he just survives and gets like two strikeouts. Super annoying. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm at. Uh, Casey and. Uh, Chicago White Sox in Chicago. We have Michael Walker taking on the White Sox. Inherently a good play because it's the White Sox. Not super enamored with the 8.7K price tag, but he's been good. Um, not last game. He only had 2.3 fantasy points, but he had 30 and 28 in two of his last four games. So form is a little bit inconsistent, but it's the White Sox. So you can definitely consider that. Um, if he's super owned, I guess you can consider leveraging with Chicago, but I don't really want to do that. Jonathan Cannon against the Royals. That's a big no for me. Royals have a collective 18% whiff rate, and they are good. And Cannon has a 250 ISO against lefties this year. Not great, Bob. So, yeah, I'm just going Royals, and I think Waka's fine, but I don't really want to play him. Yeah, he's overpriced for who he is, but the matchup right. is phenomenal. Uh, the White Sox don't have Tommy Pham anymore. Who knows who else they might trade today? Luis just Robert. Every, just everybody. <laughs> just so it could be a super cancel. watered down lineup for him. So he's okay, but not my favorite pitching play on the slate. Kansas City's right there among the top offenses. They might come in as the chalkiest offense against Cannon with a park upgrade. So I get it. Uh, they look phenomenal right there with Seattle as my highest owned stack as of now. Yeah, no argument there. They look good. Um, Rockies are visiting the Angels. We have Cal Quantrill uh, taking on the Halos, who have a 21% whiff rate. Um, they're just kind of like middle of the pack. I think they can definitely get to him in this park. Um, so I'm fine with them. Uh, not really excited to play him. I actually do like Griffin Canyon on the other side at 6.7K taking on the Rockies. Um, it is a good park for offense, but the Rockies are not good. They do whiff almost 26%. So, I, I mean, Canning is a risk, but at 6.7K against the Rockies at home, I, I don't mind him as my SP2. Yeah, I'm going to wind up with a lot of him because he's cheap and facing Colorado. And right. at least last season, he was good. He hasn't been nearly as consistent this season for whatever reason. But matchup's good. Price is good. If you want to pay up for a team like Kansas City or an expensive SP1, then Canning makes a lot of sense. On the flip side, I'm also getting to a decent amount of Colorado just because Canning is going to be chalky. Um, not Coors, but it is a good hitting park, like you said. And the Rockies do have some power. Uh, Tovar, Brenton Doyle has been hitting for a decent amount of power this season. Michael Tolia has good power numbers against right-handed pitching. So it's not the worst line. Like They're not the White Sox. There is some upside in this group. So... Uh, with canning pulling ownership, I think it makes sense to get to some Colorado in your uh, multi uh, lineup entry. Well, yeah, I mean, even if you wanted to go single entry, just fire up the. Ro- I mean, I don't have a problem with the Rockies. I just think I'm going to go uh, canning just because I like the price in this spot. But yeah, um, outside, outside of strikeouts, they actually don't look that bad. I mean, he, he's not whipping anybody. Fifteen percent whiff rate against left side. 227 ISO against lefties, 373 Woba. So, yeah. Uh, it's not like you should feel great about playing Canning. I, I just think he's in play today. All right, Patrick Corbin, another guy you shouldn't feel great about. He's a lot cheaper, but uh, in the worst spot, technically. Uh, he's taking on the D-backs. Uh, you said before we got on that this is a revenge game for Patrick Corbin, but it, jokingly, because that's, uh, that's but not it's true. Yeah, <laughs> it is, but it's not going to help him here because he's not good. 
Um, so Diamondbacks obviously look really good. Their numbers across the board in this projected lineup don't look that imposing, but uh, it's Patrick Corbin. So I have no problem going to them. And as I said, Ryan Nelson against the Nationals. Nationals don't strike out that much. And Ryan Nelson is not very good. So I'm okay with the Nats, but they're not a priority whatsoever. The only the only thing I want here is the D-backs. But honestly, there's a lot of other teams in really, really good spots. And if if I don't know why, but the, going after Corbin, that chalky play like does not work out that much. He doesn't do well, but when does he really get absolutely destroyed? Like not that much. At least when I go after him. I mean, the last he's been like not that bad lately. 19, 25 fancy points in his last two games. Um, not just getting he just doesn't get like truly demolished. Maybe like three, four runs here or there. So it's totally fine. You can do Arizona. Uh, and that is the play from this game. But uh, if it's going to be high owned, I'm going to go do something else probably. I expect them to be pretty owned. Um, it does feel a little bit trappy. I'm getting to, them, getting to them a lot right now. It's worth noting that Christian Walker left the game last night injured. If he's out, that's obviously a huge downgrade for the overall stack. That's their best hitter against righties or against lefties rather. So if he's missing, I think that downgrades the stack as a whole, but I'll still probably get to them. It will make them cheaper. I think Washington is interesting also as a lower-owned pivot stack. It's not like Brian Nelson is a guy we have to avoid. Uh, pretty good control, but that's really it as far as his skills go. Um, Washington has hit for Sun Power, C.J. Abrams, Juan Yepes for whatever reason. Um, Luis Garcia, James Wood is a big power prospect as well. Strikes out a ton, but against Ryan Nelson, hopefully that won't be an issue. So I think as a cheap secondary stack, the Nationals make a lot of sense on this slate. Um, pitching, obviously, not a factor uh, for me in this game. Yep, yep, 100%. Totally fine with the Nats, just not exactly a priority for me. All right, Dodgers and Padres. We got Glass now taking on the Padres, who don't strike out ever. Still Glass now, though. Uh, 10K, his, his price has actually come down from where it was. So obviously... He's really good, and there's nothing wrong with going to him. I think it's just going to be like a price and potential strikeouts thing for me. I'm not like racing to play him on this lead. I think there's plenty of good options. Uh, well, plenty. That's a relative term. Matt Waldron on the other side. Um, he's been okay this year and doesn't really get blown up very much, but it's still the Dodgers. Obviously, the Dodgers are stackable anytime you want to use them, and especially when they're not going to be owned. So it doesn't look like they're going to be very chalky on the slate. So that would be a very good reason to have interest in LA here. But for me, I mean, I guess I'd go glass now if I'm going to do anything here. That's probably about it. Yeah, I think glass now is reasonable. He threw 91 pitches in his first game back off the IL uh, last week. So no real leash concerns. I don't think he's going to be very like he'll be owned, but I don't think he's going to be chalk with Ray and Brown canning all pulling ownership. I think glass now might be the lowest owned to that. Uh, quartet so i think he's a reasonable reasonable play on this slate not really getting to the padres i'm not looking to pick on him too much i'm not playing waldron really either the dodgers are really watered down though um no mookie Betts, obviously no max muncie freddie freeman is questionable he's kind of got a family situation going on so not sure if he's gonna be in the lineup if he is back then i have more interest in the dodgers of course as a stack um his absence would make them cheaper but it's not the most exciting thing in the world if he's not in there so yeah i think they're reasonable if they're going to be lower I mean, obviously otani and will smith are going to be top plays at their positions but not a top stack if freeman's not in there no no good point on freeman obviously they're not full strength i mean i think you can always play otani 402 iso <laughs> against right it's very right. it's like 20 23% or 484 so. Wova, 13% walk rate. So I don't really think Waldron is going to ice him out or anything. So he could just walk him a ton and force the rest of the Dodgers to beat him. But I think Otani is going to get there today pretty easily. So I think uh, of Otani one off is certainly, uh, certainly something we can do a full Dodger stack. Not really on my radar. Um, worth noting. Hey, do you have any glean on this? By the way, hey, last time's form has been garbage. Uh, negative six, 14, and 10 in his last three games. Anything like specific that stands out and like why he's not performing or like hadn't been performing? Well, he was on the injured list. He had a back thing, apparently. Um, 
that was affecting him. He had 10 strikeouts against the Angels, and he sucked against the Giants and the Brewers and was not good against the Giants last time. Uh-huh. First start off the IL. Could have been a rust thing. He missed like three weeks. So, yeah, it's not the most comfortable way to spend 10K against a low strikeout team, but I think a guy like that, he has the highest strikeout rate on the slate. So I'm always willing to uh, willing to include a guy like that uh, in tournament lineups. Yeah, also worth noting that in two games with the Padres, he's averaged 20.8 fantasy points against them. So it's not like he hasn't been handling them on the year. So it's glass now. We can play him. I just uh, probably am not going to go crazy on ownership. All right, last game of the day, we have the Giants visiting the – oh, no, the Athletics visiting the Giants in a pitcher park. J.P. Sears against the Giants. Giants with a 27% collective uh, whiff rate. So J.P. Sears is just inherently – naturally in play i think he's actually reasonably priced 7.4k i don't have a problem with that on the other side though they have a disgusting 262 iso against lefties so the park obviously is going to kind of curb that um but the giants are in play uh on the other side we do have the chalkiest pitcher by a mile robbie ray coming at 47 percent ownership for good reason because the athletics have a 25 percent k rate and you know one game they'll go off for 18 runs and the next 10 games they'll do absolutely nothing so they are a talented offense. They do have a 218 ISO. Uh, it's obvious why Robbie Ray looks good here. 8. 8.2K, 26 fantasy points in his first start of the year. Good park for pitchers. Like everything checks out for Robbie Ray here. Here's the only reason why I wouldn't go Robbie Ray or I'd lower my ownership. Obviously, he's going to be very owned and they have a lot of pop. So if he's going to be that owned, I am absolutely sprinkling some Oakland into if I'm max entering. Um, and even if I'm entering, you know, not that many lineups. I'm probably going to prioritize Oakland a little bit just because, let I me mean, just look at the green here. They have so much power against lefties. And maybe Robbie Ray does one of the classic. Great first game back. Not so great second game back. And it's just really an ownership thing too. Yeah, I'm not getting to Oakland really. I I see the merit, obviously, with Ray um, coming in super chalky. And it is not a bad offense overall. So I see the merit to that. Um, getting to San Francisco a little bit, I think losing Soler does make them a bit less interesting overall, but they do still have good numbers against lefties. And Sears is an extreme fly ball guy, extreme home run risk for him. On the flip side, this is like the best pitcher's park on the slate. So yeah. if he's going to pitch anywhere, it might as well be here uh, for his skill set, I guess. So getting to Ray, not really getting to Sears. Um, I wish he was cheaper. If he was, I might get to him a little bit. The bats don't look great because of the park and the weather. I think it's the coldest game on the slate by far. So, yeah, both offenses grayed out decently against lefties, but not the best spot for either of them. Right. I think realistically speaking, as we just kind of recap the slate real quick, it's probably going to be Robbie Ray and Hunter Brown together if you can. If you can get there comfortably and you like the stacks you get to, they, they are the two chalkiest arms, but they also are the two arms that project the best. They're in like two really good spots. They just make the most sense on this slate. They're not even that expensive either. So uh, I do think you can play the leverage game. If I'm going to do that, it's going to be pivoting from Ray to Max Scherzer or stacking the athletics. Um, Not like crazy. I'm not going to go out there and roll like 60% Oakland stacks or anything. But I do think a sprinkling, especially as a leverage, if you're going to end up uh, playing a ton of Ray, which I probably will, uh, is, is in order. Any uh, parting thoughts of wisdom before we wrap it up? Uh, no. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for tuning in. Uh, hopefully we helped you out a little bit by breaking down these games and pointing you to the top plays of the day. If we did help you out, please give this video a like and also consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks for watching and good luck.